Right, this part of the topic then is looking at how we can extract uh, metals from um, the what's known as an ore, O-R-E. And we're going to be looking in particular at copper. Um, copper um, has some really good uses and as you probably know, um, quite a lot of it, in fact 65% of it is actually used in electrical uh, items because it's such a good conductor of electric. 25% um, is used in construction, 7% in transport and then you have other um, uses as well. Now our biggest problem is obviously copper is a valuable metal uh, which make it and, and it has properties which make it useful but the biggest problem is that humans have used so much of it that the really good stuff um, is really difficult to mine now and it's actually cheaper to recycle copper than to extract it from its ore so recycling makes better use of the limited resources it also reduces the amount of waste and pollution that we produce um, you have probably heard lots of stories on the news about how you've got scrap metal thieves that are going around uh, collecting and stealing uh, different metals because they are actually becoming worth more and more on the scrap market um, because um, they are becoming more rare. Um, this sort of thing sort of is just when you see a story of someone who's actually tried to steal a copper pipe from a house and it's used to actually deliver gas and when they cut through and create a spark they end up blowing themselves up. So we're going to be having a look at how we can actually extract the copper uh, from its ore and um, because it's usually combined with other elements to form the compound we need to be able to take the pure copper out by heating the crushed ore with carbon and this can work because the carbon is more reactive than the copper for example malachite which is a green mineral containing copper carbonate is easily broken down to form copper oxide when it's heated and carbon dioxide the copper oxide can then be heated with carbon and this is known as a reduction reaction because oxygen is removed. So um, if we looked at the word equation for that it would be copper oxide plus carbon would give you copper plus carbon dioxide. What we're going to actually have a look at now though is we're going to have a look at how we can actually get pure uh, copper um, from the process of electrolysis. Now electrolysis is basically where you have a solution and you pass electric through it and by doing that you are really just moving the electrons around um, to create um, two uh, processes of reduction and oxidation and by doing this you are making um, pure copper so let's just have a look at that in a bit more detail. Okay, so we've just talked about using copper. Um, let's just have a look, this is what we need. Okay, so in uh, electrolysis, you have electrodes which you place into the solution and the solution is called an electrolyte because it can conduct electricity. One of the electrodes is called an anode because this is the positive electrode and this is where the impure copper uh, will lose mass um, because the electrons um, will be removed. Now if you remember about atom structure if you take away some of the negativeness then you create a positive ion. At the cathode and this is the negative electrode this is where your pure copper is going to be gained so the copper will actually attach to the cathode um, to um, then uh, have the electrons added uh, to make pure copper uh, that can then be used and the impurities are just left at the bottom of uh, if you're using a beaker uh, they're just left at the bottom okay so that's looking at copper 
Now if we look at some other metals, uh, you'll see down in the bottom left hand corner we have something called alloys. If you're asked for a description of an alloy, you say it's a mixture of a metal with another element. Uh, the first one we have is uh, amalgam. Okay, amalgam uses mercury um, and this is used for tooth fillings. Now it used to be that mercury was used quite a lot in fillings um, in years gone by until scientists realised how toxic it is. And in some instances now, if someone's been buried and they've had a lot of fillings, the chances are they'll take the fillings out if they're made with mercury um, because of uh, scientists worrying about the mercury leaching out into the ground uh, and causing pollution. Brass. Brass has copper and zinc in it. Okay, if you are asked what it's used for, think about a brass band. Well, that tells you that brass is used to make instruments, musical instruments, also used to make coins. Solder. If you think about a soldering iron, and that's a long, thin, uh, red hot iron that can be used to connect electrical wires and when you put the hot iron by the electrical connections and you put a little bit of solder the heat melts the solder and that then uh, sets over the two electrical wires and can create the junction so the electric can pass through. Now solder is made from lead and tin and you can see there these are the funny sort of chemical elements PB being lead SN being tin. Again, don't forget you've got your periodic table at the back of your exam ta uh, paper if you're not sure. Always refer to it. Um, the last thing I want to look at here is something called nitinol. Now, nitinol um, is known as a smart alloy. Um, now, it was actually discovered by accident in 1962 um, and it comes from the metals it contains, which is nickel and titanium um, and uh, this smart alloy is a metal that can be bent into any shape uh, but the brilliant thing is when you, once you add some energy to it it can actually bounce back into its original shape because it's called memory wire you may have seen adverts on the TV where people have got glasses and you know that apparently if they sit on them and bend them then ooh, they'll just bend back into uh, straight back into their original shape because they remember their shape. Okay, so if we just have a look, there is one little reaction here I just want to talk about before I finish, and that's rusting. Okay, when we're talking, looking at rusting, um, I'm sure you'll have seen a little experiment where if you have a nail and you put it into a solution um, of just water, um, it won't rust. If you have an iron nail and you put it into a, um, a test tube with something called anhydrous calcium chloride, and that's just basically to take all the water out, so think about the word, hydra being water, so if it's anhydrous, it means it's taking the water out, calcium chloride, so if you take the water out but you've still got air, it doesn't rust. You have to have all three of those conditions in order for rusting to take place. So iron and oxygen and water and if that takes place you will end up with hydrated iron oxide. Thank you.